why don't we uh, go ahead and get started, Chris? All right, starting the broadcast now. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. I'd like to thank you for joining the NEI SX10 webinar today. NEI is one of the largest terminal survey construction, unmanned aircraft systems, mapping, and GIS and marine construction distributors in the United States. We've been the distributor since 1990, have 30 employees, and are headquartered in Lafayette, Louisiana. So my name is Robert Martin. I'm the technical lead for survey sales team with NEI. I'm an experienced land surveyor in two states. I've been providing terminal solutions with NEI for 10 years. With me today is Chris Trevelyan, product manager with Trimble Optical. Chris is a graduate from James Madison University and also an experienced surveyor. Chris has been a product manager on the SX-10 since 2014. So uh, before, we, before we begin, I just want to note um, that everyone is muted during the webinar. Please use the questions window to ask any questions you may have. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. We will also have poll questions for you to answer during the webinar as well. So for right now, let me turn it over to Chris and let him explain the SX-10 to you. Thanks, Robert. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you all today to introduce uh, the Trimble SX-10 scanning total station. Um, the solution we're going to talk about today, uh, we're very proud of here at Trimble. Uh, and what we've done is we've really packaged a lot of innovation into your traditional total station optics. And we've done that in an extremely familiar way. So any sir, anybody that's used to using Trimble Access on any of our controller platforms can pick this up and get right into the robotic workflow very seamless and easily. Um, but with all of that innovation, uh, with the merger of true high-speed scanning and full um, optics capabilities of your, of your robotic total station, we've also expanded the versatility uh, of this optical platform. And we'll kind of show exactly how, in relation to um, scanning specific workflows, for the surveyor uh, throughout this presentation. So to begin here, what I want to do is just ask you guys quickly a, um, a polling question. So if you could, uh, maybe just submit your answers real quick and just kind of gauge for um, you know how we're going to discuss the rest of this presentation um, so I know everybody's experience level. All right, so most of the voting has come in there, and we're just going to share that with you. So it looks like uh, most of the folks out there have been using robotic toll stations, so that's good. For those of you that, that won't, I'll, I'll talk about why this is um, specific for, or the robotic solution here uh, is specific and advantageous uh, for our survey customers. So. I want to begin with maybe a little uh, history of the development cycle here at Trimble, and I won't get in too deep, but you know the, qu the basic question, the root question here was, we know that we wanted to uh, accommodate and bring together the survey workflow and the, uh, the versatility of scanning. And there was a lot of back and forth about how do we really accomplish that? Do we create a total station that can scan? Do we create a scanner that can orient itself like a total station? And we went back and forth with the hardware choices, but, the, but at the end of the day, what we said was, and I think these pictures really explain it well, is that uh, you know, the total station is traditionally with you every single day. I come from a survey firm that had about 20 crews out in the field. We were running, um, you know, every single crew had a GNSS kit and they had a, a robotic total station kit, and that equipment was being used every single day. Um, conversely, we had one scanner that kind of sat in the office 
uh, and got used by this specific people every once in a while that had the expertise around the scanning. Um, so our goal at Trimble is to really combine uh, that flexibility and versatility of the scanner in a familiar workflow that I spoke about earlier and something that you can carry with you and a tool that you can have available every single day. Uh, and there's a lot of important factors that go into that that we had to take um, into consideration, including coordinate system transformation, scale factor corrections, all of that stuff that is traditional in your optical workflow. Uh, we need to make sure that the scanning fits into that. Um, the beauty of this is that the ability to do it in the survey workflow reduces a whole lot of time in the field. It reduces a whole lot of time in the office. We don't need uh, targets, you know, instead of targets, we're using prisms to do our backsiding traditional workflow. And back in the office, when we have that orientation, uh, there is no registration, and we're getting to work immediately with the data instead of having to fumble around uh, with the registration process. Uh, and the other beauties of it, again, is that familiar feel, so it fits into some of the um, you know, the enhancements that we have in Trimble Access, like the integrated survey and some of the multitasking that I'll talk about later uh, is where this equipment really shines. So I do want to ask another poll question here for you all, and that is, uh, have you ever used laser scanning before? So please take a moment to go ahead and answer that for us. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that one down. So it looks like a pretty similar uh, results as compared to our uh, robotic answers there. So we have, you know, about two thirds of you looking at using robotics and using um, scanners before. Uh, so that's good, um, good baseline there. All right. So. Well, when I talk about the combination of these things, uh, the challenge was really how to combine them in a mechanical way to achieve all of the accuracies and capabilities that you expect in your optical survey instrument, whether that's auto lock or robotic. Uh, so if you look at the left-hand column here, uh, these are some of the key factors that we pegged to the board and said, if it's going to be a high-quality total station, it needs to be accurate, it needs to have good distance measurement accuracies, we need to have you know, the total station ranges so that we can measure prisms at distance, um, and have good auto lock robotic range uh, for those robotic operations. And then as we looked at the scanning side of things, um, we wanted to bring in not the million points per second that you hear touted and thrown around the scanning industry today because that's uh, Hey, Robert, I'm getting a little feedback from your line. Do you mind uh, muting yourself? All right, thanks. That's much better. Um, so with the scanning side of things, we looked at it as an approach of how do we best fit scanning into the workflow of the surveyor. They don't need a million points per second. They don't need necessarily the density that um, a high, true high-speed laser scanning gets. What's important to them uh, is a good coverage, a good distance range, and a good... Um, uh, repeatable noise range. So uh, when we talk about the things that we uh, really wanted to key in on, we look at a good spacing level um, for our points over a full consistent range of the scanning range. So we have a good 600 meter scanning range uh, and we have very consistent range noise so that data integrity remains from a, a measurement close to the instrument and a measurement far away from the instrument. So we have about a 1.5 millimeter uh, noise range. And that's important uh, as later I'll talk about some of the, the range and coordinate system transformations and, and scale factor transformations that bring this data together. We need to have it very consistent so we don't get those like double wall situations uh, during, um, you know, when we're looking at the data later. And all of this also is combined uniquely with the vision capabilities of Trimble Robotics and Trimble Instruments. Um, and I'll show you why that's important in this particular instrument as we move forward here. 
So I wanted to take a, another second just to describe a little bit more about the beam deflection that I'm talking about. So there is scanning hardware in your total station. And traditionally what I look at is that your total station sends out a single beam and that is tied to your horizontal and vertical angles and it can't move irrespective of those horizontal and vertical angles. What we've done here by introducing what we call a, a deflection prism, we're able to sweep that beam across a, a band is what we call it. So we have this small band that sweeps across an area that it gives us uh, more capabilities, a very fast sweeping of this beam, uh, and gives us more capabilities to cover a, bit, a larger area fast. So we create this pattern out of this sweeping. So if I look at this crosshair of my total station, that's one path, and as I move up that vertical motion of my telescope, I'm able to cover a larger horizontal uh, area, and then I move over and go down and, again, create this kind of grid pattern. And these points are set um, in space based on the rotation of the, the prism. That's not really important, but if we want to densify this pattern, we're going to create this same exact grid and just shift it slightly horizontally and vertical to basically fill in the gaps and densify our network. So if we go back to our dam example here, what we look at is if we wanted to scan this area, we would just box off a certain area and then use this banding pattern to quickly cover that area instead of taking discrete single point measurements at a very high rate like uh, some other um, scanning enabled total stations on the market. So this one is actually true scanning hardware inside of the telescope of the instrument. I want to make sure that um, because that is a key uh, differentiator for this instrument and allows us to be more productive in the field. And the way we are more productive by covering that larger area, it enables us to capture a full dome. When I say a full dome, I mean full 360 degrees around you, full 300 degrees from basically the base of the tripod all the way up and over the zenith back to the base of the other tripod, so or of the leg of your tripod. So that's full dome in less than than 12 minutes at our course setting. We can also add imagery to that and do that at, within two and a half minutes. But we also give the surveyor the option to just frame out the area you need because you don't always need to just push one button and get everything. Uh, a, a side of a highway is a great example where everything behind you, you don't care, it's just a fence and a field and a bunch of nothing. Uh, trees maybe, and in the case you want to focus all of your area of scanning right on the roadway in front of you. So we give the surveyor the framing options. You saw in the, in the example before, the dam example, we used a rectangular framing option. We can also use polygons for irregular shapes, um, horizontal band where we just capture 360 degrees. And in this example on the right, it's a great case because I can just pinpoint the top of that uh, telephone pole and say, you know what, start here, get everything below that point, uh, and then I don't have to waste all the time scanning the sky. So that's going to greatly reduce uh, the time in the field to implement this scan. Uh, and then, of course, the full dome. But again, this all allows the surveyor to focus right on the right uh, area of interest. It reduces the data footprint when we're talking about capture. It reduces the time, obviously. And it allows us to get Again, just the information we want, and this lower example is a perfect example of that. So you see the building um, just outside on the outside edges of that picture, and my course density was plenty sufficient for me to gather building corners, brick facade, flow line of that concrete pan in front of uh, this flange head. Um, but when I wanted the really high level of detail, I framed out the, the flange head and the pipe, and I was able to really key in on, you know, I can literally pick out the nuts and bolts of that flange head with a higher density level. Um, so that gives us the versatility to attack any project in any situation uh, with a unique perspective. And as I mentioned a bit earlier, all of this is coordinated with your backside station setup routines or your resection routines, however you do that in the field. So it's a very familiar workflow, and these scans are automatically coordinated with your survey work. There is absolutely no registration needed. Uh, that's critical in a few elements because it eliminates the need to have enough overlap. If I think of, uh, I'll show a perfect example later where this comes into, into play, but when I want to do a registration piece, for those of you that have scanned in the past, 
I have to ensure that I have enough overlap so the computer algorithms know how to mesh everything together and match it all together. With this, my survey station setup matches everything together cleanly and easily in the field. It allows us to review the data in the field, and it also allows us to analyze and measure directly from that point cloud on the controller in the field, whether that's inverse measurements, volume calculations, uh, create surfaces right then and there on the tablet PC. And the beautiful part about this is I don't have to teach any of you anything new. So any of you that have gone through your survey courses in the past that know about traverse adjustments and network adjustments for error reductions in your survey work, that is how I talk about my point cloud refinement. I am doing a traverse or network adjustment to my survey stations, and the point clouds will follow uh, those error reductions in my traverse. So it's really, it, it truly is scanning for the survey. Another important part is that we needed to introduce these PPM and scale factor corrections. So any of you working with uh, point clouds in the past, you know that sometimes bringing all that data in, you may get the PPM corrections in the field, uh, but your, your coordinate system um, scale factor corrections may not always apply, so you kind of have to apply the, try to apply that in the office to fit the control that you've set up on the site perfectly. Um, so you're constantly kind of struggling between these two datums, uh, really your scanning datum and your control datum. And what we've done here is just obviously that point cloud has to live and breathe with uh, all of our other measurements. Uh, this example here is perfect with uh, my DR observation of 5030, and you can see uncorrected point cloud measurements to the corrected values um, due to the atmospheric or the scale factor corrections. Anytime you change anything in TBC, all of those point clouds live and breathe uh, with those adjustments, so it's tied directly into all of the elements that make your, uh, the integrity of your survey data what it is. So I do want to ask another question as we kind of move beyond uh, the scanning. And let's go into here. Or excuse me, we want to ask another uh, question here. And that is, do you use photogrammetry uh, in your current workflow? I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer this one. Thank you all for being uh, so attentive and participating with us because this is definitely helping us. Uh, with these discussions. All right, and time is up. We're going to close that and share. So as I predict or expected, um, photogrammetry uh, is a tool that's used slightly less uh, than the scanning or the robotic workflow, but still an uh, important piece. And it's good that uh, a lot of you recognize some of the, uh, the things that I may speak to in the coming slides. So when we talk about um, photogrammetry, there's a couple of different um, uh, schools there. But what I'm talking about is a calibrated camera system in the instrument itself. Uh, as you've probably already noticed, the instrument itself here from these pictures does not have an eyepiece. So we're using a lot of the principles of um, the photogrammetric practice and applying these to the cameras in this unit to give us a fully calibrated camera system. That is very important here. Everything is uniquely calibrated. Each instrument has its own specific calibration for how the camera sensors align. Um, and the reason we need that is, is because of total station precision. I showed you earlier that this is a one second instrument and we have to achieve one second aiming and pointing with this instrument in order for us to pitch it as such. Um, but the, it also allows us, the Trimble Vision also allows us for rapid instrument control, um, full station setup documentation, uh, and point cloud colorization, things like that. And I talk about this camera system because there's three different cameras, all experience is kind of one camera system that will allow us to zoom from a very wide field of view down to an extremely narrow field of view, overall giving uh, 84 times zoom from zoom level one to six. Um, the examples here at the right on the top, that is a, a backside target at about two football fields in length. Uh, the lower one with Trimble Access is showing um, 
a measurement to a high tension, high voltage power line uh, just above that insulator cap at 190 meters, so just under two football fields uh, in length. So very impressive pointing capabilities um, with all of these calibrated systems uh, for this instrument. Here's kind of a, a, a you know a blown up view of what we were just looking at in that at Trimble Access example. And when I really blow up the access piece of it here, and I'm looking at um, this zoom level uh, with the crosshairs, you can clearly see that we've we've tried to show you what the representation of the spot size of the laser distance measurement unit would be at that distance. So extremely accurate, very good pointing precision there, um, and something we needed to ensure in order to be able to point this instrument at a one second accuracy. So all in all, that, that vision system is really allowing us to navigate, document, and guide the instrument in the field to a high level of detail and precision. It's also allowing us to document those station setups. Here I'm doing a stakeout routine to a, a point, and you can see on the right-hand side, uh, my point has been flagged. and showing me that I'm kind of out of tolerance for that stakeout. I have a fill of uh, almost 15 huns. And, um, you know, so I get that site context right back into the office um, as such. And moving <clears throat> beyond that, um, the vision piece, there's more capabilities of this instrument and the familiarity of it is just, um, it's really powerful. The more I give this instrument to people, uh, the more confident I am to say that because people are just up and running. But one of the things that continues to j impress me as well is the power of integrated survey. And it really stands out with this instrument combination. And whether that's an R8, uh, an R6, or an R10 GNSS receiver, um, you integrate that with your workflow so that you can do station setup resections for the SX10 on the fly. So if you have a site with RTK or if you're using a VRS network, you can show up on site, you know, occupy two or three GNSS points, uh, measure the distance to the prism at the same time uh, from the SX-10 and coordinate yourself in the field on your site instantly um, without any other pre-established control. Uh, that is a huge increase in productivity and flexibility for this instrument. You can see below, uh, those were the residuals from my resection. We're talking thousands of a U.S. survey foot. Uh, that is certainly within the air budget uh, of a rod that you haven't changed out the tip in, in about six months. And as they get rounded, you got a couple of thousands floating around there anyway. So uh, the beauty is you just launch your SX-10 as well into a scan. So the bottom right, you see a building that I had scanned. And while it's scanning, you can switch right over to the GNSS and start making measurements. Here I was observing uh, the flow line. So I wanted some critical hard brake line elements, and I started measuring those uh, while the instrument was scanning at the same time. We call that actually multitasking, um, but it is, a, it is a function of the integrated survey um, capability of this instrument. Um, just a really nice way to do it. So we also talked about the versatility in one of those opening slides. And uh, up until now, I've been talking about using the SX-10 in a strictly survey workflow. And all of those survey styles that we've had in the past uh, are going to be the same ones you're using with the SX-10. But we've added one station setup type, and that is called a scan station setup type. And you can use that directly in the same job, but the benefit is you're not putting this on a traverse point, you're not putting this on known control, you're not having to resection. You just plunk the thing down and you scan, and then you can use um, a registration technique in the office if you want for those limited station setups that you did in this manner. What it does is it allows for quick deployment in the field, so you don't have to put throw in another traverse point. Um, and really transfers that back into the office. And here I want to show kind of a quick example of that. So if we have this big building here, let's think it's like a maybe a FedEx distribution center, you know, with Christmas around the corner, those guys are going to be gearing up. And you have a lot of activity, maybe you got to survey this building. And there's a big loading dock that's kind of a, a recess here. And you can't see it from some of your survey setups. Well, you can just plunk down another one scan that area, and as long as you have overlap between the surveyed scans and this scan station, 
you'll easily be able to tie that back to the control uh, in the office and then capture some of those details that you may have missed um, from the, sh the station setup shadowing in an area that obviously wouldn't be conducive uh, to GNSS either. So that's a bit about the instrument um, and kind of how that fits into the survey workflow. And that now I want to talk about some specific examples and um, uh, to do this. So some general topo examples, uh, some uh, volumetric examples. So we'll just dive right in to one of the most basic and uh, fundamental parts of most surveyors' business, and that is the topographic uh, and general survey. So here I'm talking about a commercial property shopping complex as built uh, where we have a set of like Alta standards that we have to achieve. So we have to capture uh, all of the improvements on site. Uh, they wanted one foot contours on this site. They wanted all the building envelopes, you know, so all the detail that's out on this site. So we went out with the traditional method of capture, you know, using GNSS, using uh, robotic and using scanning. Uh, in this case was kind of the new addition to uh, this project type. And we used integrated surveying, uh, or excuse me, these customers used integrated surveying uh, with an R10 GNSS receiver so they could go out on their VRS network and quickly set up and start working. They used some of that multitasking that I talked about uh, where the instrument was scanning, they were off capturing uh, some of the flow line elements, things like that, and Overall total time in the field was about five man hours. You know, for a project like this that came down as a bid, so you know, they bid a contract amount, they won the bid, you know, getting in and out of the site quickly like that allowed them to save overall the money uh, on that contract. So it wasn't a T&M job, uh, just that contract job. So they were able to quickly accomplish the field work. They had more data than they needed for this site so they were able to go back to the site virtually uh, using the point cloud and the images rather than redeploying to the site which would have eaten into that profit that they were looking at from uh, the reduction in field time. So I know that the uh, at the point that I talked to them they weren't completely finished drafting up the uh, the plan set but just to give you kind of a rough idea and I plunked the scale bar down and what they had worked on but Within a couple of hours of feature extraction, they already had the building corners. Um, you know, they had done their uh, feature uh, feature coding, so they have all the line work of their roads. Uh, you know, and they were they were at a point within about a day's work overall to get to the the basics of their drawing. So another day in the office, I think, is what they told me, uh, and they were able to deliver this. So really saving them a lot of money and allowing them to be um, productive on this job. So the benefits overall in this workflow, again, quick station setup um, once you find that control or once you go out on site, sorry, to just establish a few GNSS points and really get to work uh, immediately. The, uh, the multitasking so that they could go maybe behind the building and capture a couple of elements that were just on the scope of their project. They probably didn't need to scan. Um, but their instrument was set up somewhere already scanning, so they were able to capture those with GNSS at the same time. Typically on a project like this, if you were to bring all this data back into uh, a, a, the office, all the scan data, sorry, talking about it with my scanning hat on, um, it would have probably taken two, maybe three hours just to do the scan registration and fitting all of that scan data to your control. Um, and you would have to use that expertise in the office to do that before your drafters ever even got to take a look at this job. So the beauty here is that I'm processing feature codes and I'm working with the point cloud immediately. Um, we have a regional classification tool in TBC now that is extremely valuable. You can see here that it's highlighted the buildings in purple, the vegetation in green, the ground in brown, um, so that I can isolate each one of those layers and work with them individually. For example, uh, identifying building envelopes. Uh, I can quickly draw my polyline. I can set that to my finished floor elevation so that I'm defining uh, my, my polyline in 3D um, for the end client there uh, very quickly. Uh, with the ground, I can turn everything off, isolate the ground, use all my uh, break lines from 
the, uh, the feature coding workflow and really establish a nice clean overall uh, ground surface to work with here so I can get very accurate contours. Jumping into an example about uh, the utility uh, industry or power line as built in this particular example. So we're looking at uh, the goal here was just to as built this power line uh, as it ran through uh, what is going to be a little bit of future development. They were looking for attachment points, clearances of lines, things like that. And we went out, or this customer, sorry again, went out on site using uh, GNSS integrated survey. Um, typically on a long corridor project like this, if you were trying to survey down the line, you would have a, a backside set up and you'd be kind of flopping tops. It'd be a lot of driving back and forth. Um, what they were able to do here with the integrated survey style was just quickly set up, bang, bang, position themselves and get to work scanning. Uh, they used kind of a polygon method of framing out these wires, so just, you know, uh, an odd shape to reduce the amount of time the instrument was trying to scan objects that they didn't need. Overall, this project took about three hours of field time with a one-man crew. And then back in the office, they were extracting all of their attachment points uh, and getting the, the information to the end client about three hours uh, for the basic plotting. <clears throat> the benefits here using the system, again, this was another contract bid job, so they were able to get out you know, survey 1.6 kilometers of power line very quickly um, using that integrated survey technique. Um, when we look at this, uh, this as well, what really jumps out to me is for any of you that have scanned objects like this, they look very similar. So it's Tower A and Tower C, you know, they were probably fabricated in the same shop. They probably have the same type of insulator. Um, so the algorithms in the software tend to view those very uh, similarly. They get, it gets confused, let's say, uh, to put it into to easy terms. It gets confused and it doesn't know how to do the registration quite as easily and efficiently. While I'm able to stretch out my total, my, um, total station setup so I don't need really consistent overlap, I don't need a lot of targets on the ground to help me differentiate uh, column A from column B or tower A from tower B, so it really gives me the, the ability to stretch those stations out, use the full range capability of the SX-10 um, so that I just barely need to start to overlap where the point clouds come together. Because in this case, I didn't need an extremely high density on the power lines. I just needed to get my catenary sags and my attachment points. So as long as I got the tower in high detail and as long as my wires overlapped, I was getting all, they were getting all of the detail they needed here. <clears throat> and that, again, the key for saving time and registration, boom, the data is right in there. We use six setups to cover 1.6 kilometers. Uh, that's a really productive way to work in any corridor situation. Uh, this power line just kind of highlights uh, how impressive that is in itself. And again, the ability to use, like you see here, the camera to help augment and see some of those in higher detail we have that pan the telephoto camera in the middle there, five megapixel. But we also have the five megapixel camera on the outside there, the overview camera. So you can clearly see the difference in um, data quality as you zoom in and as we needed to get uh, additional high res images of some of those insulated caps. So here's a great example of a bridge and roadway infrastructure. And there's probably going to be more detail on this one uh, in coming uh, webinars from Trimble here. But the, the goal here was a complete as-build of this bridge post-construction, right? You can see here in this example, they were still doing construction work. And uh, the client wanted the as-build, everything, new roadway, new bridgeway, all that stuff. So we went out, they went out on site, again, uh, integrated survey, setups. That kept us from having to hop back and forth across the bridge. Um, they used horizontal bands because they didn't need any of the elements in the sky, uh, reducing the scan time. Uh, and then they used polygon framing for the scan to get the bridge in higher detail. The important part here was they had no traffic control, no need, um, because they could measure the highway from a safe distance, uh, reducing their cost overall for getting uh, the, the detail and data they needed on the roadway 
uh, reducing the cost and having somebody safety traffic control having to wait for permits and work with permits uh, this particular job was in Germany and I don't know how strict they are there but uh, I imagine it's it's as strict as it's some of the Department of Transportation's here in the United States all in all the field deployment for this, this data was four and a quarter hours with a one-man robotic crew and that included um, as building these roundabouts uh, as well So again, to talk about the benefits of this instrument in this particular workflow um, is, like I said, avoid lane closures, the ability to multitask, so our instrument is scanning, we're capturing GNSS observations on the roundabouts and the clear sky areas, um, and then the unique ability of this instrument to do what's called, uh, the, well, the band scanning I talked about, uh, but then the densification of your scan, so if we crank up the scan level, um, to the next highest density, the instrument goes back and inlays another grid pattern and that allows us to get still good densities even as the traffic is moving through, good densities on the ground, I should say, even as the traffic is moving through because the next time the instrument comes back through to scan the same grid pattern with a slight shift, the traffic is totally different. So the situation is different and we're capturing new, uh, a new area of information and maybe filling in some of those ghosting or shadowed areas uh, from the previous pass with traffic. Also, there's a really amazing uh, new workflow in TBC, and in this example, kind of highlights and shines there is that, uh, so on this pillar, on this column here, they wanted the uh, bolt hole locations. And if we go back to the, one of the earlier slides, I talk about we didn't design this scanner to be your one million points per second scanner and blah, all that stuff. We really wanted it to fit into the survey workflow and as a part of that we have the advantage here and the added benefit of the very calibrated camera system, uh, the very precisely calibrated camera system in the SX-10. So what we can use is the sighting line from the instrument to an object like these bolt hole locations so I didn't have scan points or reflectorless observations on these in the field, but I'm able to see my scan data. That scan data is able to give me depth away from the instrument. And then the pixel that I pick in my picture is very precisely calibrated to my instrument. So I know what relationship that has to my horizontal and vertical angle of my servos at the time uh, that the image was captured. And I'm able to, in effect, measure what we call a virtual DR shot in the office uh, after the field collection has been done. So we were, the customer here was able to extract uh, these bolt hole locations um, for uh, their client post survey um, using that augmented workflow and it's something very unique to this system uh, and TBC included in that system approach here. So I'm going to try to show you a little video. I hope it comes through. Um, it's looking a little choppy, but this is just an example of a roadway survey that we did using the SX-10. You can see some of the work there done in Access, now jumping into the classification tool, uh, and there picking out the center uh, in TBC, creating an alignment, and doing the drive-through of that alignment and basically pulling out cross-sections, as-built cross-sections there. So um, just a full field-to-finish workflow using this instrument and the, and the goal of that particular project was uh, to rehabilitate a dirt road and to pave it and put curb lanes in so they needed to know, you know overall volume assessment, how much dirt is going to come in, things like that. So really uh, good field to finish workflow utilizing the SX-10 Trimble Access all the way through TBC. One of our beta customers um, you know, quickly jumped on this and said, hey man, this is amazing for our intersection topos. Um, you know, it eliminated the need for traffic control and jumping out in the middle of the street. Uh, and here you can see how good the intensity value of the scan registers all of those lane stripings clearly delineates the curb and gutter, the poles, all the intricacies of that intersection. Uh, for our volume workflow, and this is a pretty obvious one here, is that the fact of you know not working around heavy equipment, 
very accurately capturing the details of the site. I know from time to time, walking around some of these, these piles, uh, for me when I was surveying, wasn't always that safe or it was strenuous. Um, so the ability to use the scanning to capture very high accurate detail that I maybe would have skipped over or tried to personally average out uh, while I was doing my volume calculation in the field. Um, but with this, go with this it, we used a combination of the robotic and the scanning workflow um, to really get us uh, a good finished product. Having the survey workflow augmented in with the scanning helps us clearly define the break lines. So we're sitting down in a hole here shooting up to the tops, right, and not being able to clearly see those tops or having a bad angle of incident for the uh, uh, for the scanner. Also, native grass and brush sometimes would uh, prohibit the scanner to be able to like observe that top clearly. Uh, so we're able to take the survey rod with the, you know, our prism on the pole uh, and clearly define our break lines for where we wanted the top to be defined and the basically the extents of our survey. Um, so that's a good augmentation of how to bring those together. We actually had to dumb the data down quite a bit, so even though we don't scan as fast as a million points per second, we still had to sample the data down in TBC and we're still able to give a very, very accurate result uh, to the client within a very short period of time. Um, this was more of a T&M job, so the concern here uh, was mostly around safety and uh, eliminating the need for a stop in operations. Um, so if these guys are moving and they're working on pay quantities, they want to get as much dirt out of there as they can in a short period of time. Uh, and it, having a surveyor walk in their way and try to stop their operation is just burdensome. Uh, so this allowed us to do it safely, allowed us to work together well with the site in order to accomplish the goal and, and to uh, keep them happy as a customer. Here's another uh, video that I hope comes through here. Uh, this is just showing a stockpile. And I want to mention that there is a 12-part um, a video series that we just uh, published here at Trimble um, on the Trimble Geospatial YouTube channel uh, that goes through this particular example from data capture through cleanup through uh, volume preparation. So if you want to get a really good idea of what you just saw, uh, maybe choppy in that video, uh, it's about, it's 12 chapters and it's about an hour long. You can watch them as you want uh, to give you an overall view of, of that volume workflow. And we plan to release a few more. So I've got two more examples here uh, as we draw to the close here. And um, those are, you know, uh, one of our customers here, and this is a company I used to work with, uh, they're a good sounding board for us to make sure we're not uh, developing BS, right? And we're trying to bring the right products uh, to you in market. And they came to me and they said, you know what, that, that SX10 you talked to us about, I think we got the perfect project for it. Uh, the county and city of Denver came to us and said, hey, we need this survey, uh, but we don't want a survey but we kind of want this survey of this area. So they didn't want to pay for a pure boundary, full boundary survey, but they wanted what they called a land title review. Uh, and it's around the Denver Coliseum in the stockyard. So if any of you have joined us for the National Western Stock Show, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I would encourage you to come visit. Uh, and, uh, and they were out on this site here, and it's a complex site. So you see the, the Denver Coliseum there in the picture. You can see the overpass. That is Interstate 70. Uh, that runs right through the middle of their project, splits it right in half. Um, so there's a lot of complexity here, and the county coming to them saying, yeah, we're not really sure what level of detail. This doesn't really follow any ALTA standards, um, but, you know, capture all of the, uh, the access areas for the vehicles and, you know, so the guys started to worry that, okay, what happens if I don't capture all the light poles and they come back and want those? What happens if I don't capture you know, all of the improvements that are out there and they come back and for some reason they want those? Um, and that was a concern for them because, again, it was a contract bid and any time that they had to redeploy to this massive site to redo work um, was going to really hit into uh, the profitability of this project. So they came to us and said, hey, you know, we think that having the scanning augment our current workflow would be great here. So we're going to go out. They're out on site. They're doing the G GNSS RTK. You know, they have a single base set up. 
Uh, and then they were doing optical shots. Obviously, places like underneath that overpass, you can't get GNSS for obvious reasons, and they needed to get details of um, uh, the, the roadways through there. And the, um, there's an interesting kind of walkway from the Coliseum over to the stock show. So there's a high complexity, high level of complexity, and they wanted to use this augmented workflow to do uh, kind of both things. So. Uh, what came out of it was the benefits of this system was that all of the data together, their GNSS data, uh, their optical data, and their scan data all just fit right together into the same project immediately. You can see that in this example. I've got my uh, green optical observation lines from my station setup, and then I have my scan data overlaid right then and there. Um, so they were also able to take this information and export it directly over to the AutoCAD where the city and county had provided them high resolution imagery. Uh, so they were able to drop it right in on their CAD file, make sure the data aligned well uh, with the local coordinate system that the county, city and county were using for this particular project. So it was a very complex project uh, and having the uh, scan data and the imagery data has really given them another level of confidence that their drafters are immediately working with the data and if anything was missed they can extract it straight from that data. <clears throat> and while they were doing this big Denver project, uh, one of the, the Denver branch manager got a call from a client. Um, they were doing layout for a 15-story high-rise in downtown Denver and uh, he got a call from the client. He was all panicked. He said, hey, man, something's not working. These prefab panels that we're putting up on this building aren't fitting. Uh, can you tell us why? And the area of concern was for this elevator shaft that you can kind of see right over the top center of the instrument there going up the building. And he said, these prefab panels aren't fitting. You can see they've installed them kind of right there on the second or third level. Uh, but going up, they were having a problem. So. They took the instrument, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning, ran over to the other site, scanned it really quickly. They um, got out on site. They were on their building control, so they have a very high accurate uh, control network around this building related back to the building grid. Uh, and at noon, Kurt called and thanked me. He said, hey, man, thanks for letting us borrow this instrument. It just saved uh, this company a bunch of downtime because the project was on hold until they could get the... Uh, the data bag. So very quickly and easily he was able to extract information out of that scan cloud, relate it back to the, uh, the, the building grid and tell them not only were their walls bowing together but they were also leaning too far out towards the street. Uh, they were able to tell them that immediately or within you know from 9 a.m. to uh, Kurt was kicking out information by lunchtime to this client and said this is what you need to do to fix it. Uh, and they were able to implement action right away. Uh, so instead of going out on site and taking some discrete uh, reflectorless measurements, Kurt was able to grab a lot of this detail. Uh, no office registration needed meant that he was able to do it right then and there uh, and on their high accuracy network. So it gave him the confidence of seeing their backside foresight observations around their network to control. Uh, but the story didn't really end there. The customer was really happy with uh, that performance and called uh, Kurt back uh, a couple weeks later and said, hey, uh, our prefab railings now aren't fitting on the, uh, uh, these balconies. Can you tell us what's going on? So they went back out on site. They did two station setups that covered the whole area of the building, uh, cranked up the density just a touch uh, because they were in such a focused area. And within these two setups, they were able to cover the full side of the building, give them the immediate results again, just like the last time. And then, uh, if for any of you who know, we just had Trimble Dimensions. Uh, Flatirons was with me during the presentation talking exactly about this. And Monday, I'm waiting around for Kurt, looking at my, my phone time, and like, oh, where's Kurt? And it turns out uh, he had gotten a call that morning from the same client and said, you know, we're having the same problem on the other balconies. Uh, what would it take to get somebody back out here and scan that area for us? Uh, Kurt was able to, in his hotel room, using the same exact data, extract all the information they needed in less than 10 minutes. Uh, again, this is a T&M job, uh, but the important part there is, you know, they are the go-to now for this customer because they're keeping them extremely happy. 
Uh, they're keeping the cost down uh, in terms of, you know, they're still getting a change order for this extra work, um, but they're doing it very efficiently and the customer sees that and is able and willing to call them uh, to do those cut types of changes right then and there on the field. So that is uh, my presentation in a nutshell. I do have another uh, polling question from the gentleman here at NEI. And that was one, um, and we'll keep this one um, um, personal so we won't share it all. Um, I'd like for you guys to answer this honestly so the gentleman at NEI can work with you to, uh, to set something up. <clears throat> I'll give it a few more seconds. And it, let me say, if they do come out in the field um, and give this demonstration, I, I want you guys to be running the instrument um, early on in that demonstration. So let them teach you the bells and whistles, uh, but really take control of it and take ownership there. And uh, I think you'll be impressed at how intuitive it is and how easy it is to use. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. Just uh, note that the resounding answer uh, was yes, uh, not everyone, but the resounding answer was yes. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it back over to Robert to hopefully unmute yourself, and we have a couple of questions uh, that we wanted to cover here. Yeah, Chris, I really want to thank you for that. You did a, just an absolutely fabulous job with that uh, presentation for us. Uh, I don't think we could thank you enough. And we do have a few questions. Um, one of them is, what is the process to combine scan data from the Trimble SX-10 scanning total station to my survey data? So uh, we kind of talked about that a, a little bit throughout the presentation, but there is the easiest way to do it is to simply use the survey workflow um, because your scan data is coordinated right then and there in the field uh, with no manipulation of the scan data. In fact, you can, if you do the survey workflow, you cannot decouple, uh, well, let's just say that you don't decouple the survey data. It is fixed and set with your survey observations. So you would try to adjust the error out of your um, survey network. There is the non-registered non scan station workflow that I talked about. You can either do that in a hybrid workflow um, where it registers it back to your survey scans, or you can use it as a standalone scanner if you really want. So you could set it up and just do scan stations around the area and use a process of registration similar to the, uh, the traditional scanning workflow. Uh, you can do that in TBC or you can do that in Trimble RealWorks as well if you're a RealWorks user um, using plane-based or target-based registration if that's the way you want to go. So, Chris, we have another question here that I think is really interesting. It is, the SX-10 doesn't have an eyepiece. Can I aim accurately without an eyepiece? Uh, yes, and that was paramount for the surveyors, uh, or the former surveyors that work here at Trimble. Again, a lot of, a lot of us have been out, out of the field for a while, but we understand the importance of accuracy and the fundamental development of uh, or fundamental design of a total station really has your crosshairs as your optical uh, alignment piece. So in a traditional development we use the crosshairs, we align everything to the crosshairs and that's what we use for pointing and aiming. Um, with this one we actually use the EDM beam and we align all of the sensors of the instrument to the EDM beam so that you know you're, you're pointing at exactly the right spot on the instrument that is precisely calibrated uh, with the horizontal vertical angle. Uh, and then when we set out to introduce the cameras into this and, and to keep the cameras as a part of this, um, the telephoto camera has an extremely small field of view, but it is still five megapixels. Um, so I don't want to get down into the weeds too much, but if we break that five million pixels down in an extremely small field of view, we've made it such that you can control the instrument by a pixel to pixel movement. And from one pixel to the next at the, at the very highest zoom level of this instrument, one pixel movement means you're moving the instrument one arc second. So that's how we're able to accomplish uh, a very accurate pointing without an eyepiece. And I would argue 
that my experience now would lead me to um, use this more if I wanted an accurate reflectorless observation because you can see clearer uh, and you can move in a much smaller increment uh, with the SX10 than you can in optical. I hope that answered the question. Um, here's one that I get a lot uh, about robotic totalization. There is no display. Why does this instrument not have a display? Um, you know, there's a couple of reasons there. We wanted to reduce the cost and complexity out of this instrument. Um, I don't know if any of you have talked to um, your representatives in NEI about uh, this instrument, but we feel like we brought it in at a very competitive cost with a very competitive um, workflow and, and a very familiar workflow. So uh, we did a few things with the display. We made the decision early on that this instrument is to be a robotic instrument and that's it. There's no point in uh, we felt of having somebody behind the instrument telling it what to do. We wanted all of the intelligence and decision making uh, at the rod, so to speak, and, and guiding this um, uh, this instrument robotically. Uh, and as such, we made the call early on that we wanted to simplify the hardware and we didn't want you pressing buttons on the instrument necessarily during the operations. It, in order to get the best accuracies out of the instrument, it's good to have it stabilized. Uh, and if you're trying to achieve uh, one, even two seconds in the field, it's good to not really um, <clears throat> be pecking on the instrument very hard because, <clears throat> excuse me, that's just introducing uh, unnecessary motion uh, to the to servos and trying to compensate out with things like um, SurePoint. Okay, Chris, I got, I'm got. i just going to ask you, we're about to run out of time, so I'm going to ask you one more question. The rest of the questions we'll just have to uh, email responses to, but this one comes up a lot. I thought it was important. How big are the scan files? <clears throat> okay, um, the scan files for this, so we use uh, a compression uh, algorithm that's specific to Trimble uh, on the tablet itself, and that compression is called a, an RWCX compression. Uh, again, Trimble proprietary, but that allows us to keep it to about um, a basic rule of thumb is about 50,000 points per megabyte of space on the controller. Um, and to to maybe give you a, a good example here, give me a second, I'm kind of looking it up on my other screen, but uh, to give you a good example of uh, a full dome scan inside of a building, so that would register uh, the highest number of points returned uh, would be about 7, uh, 7.1 to 7.6 million points, and that's approximately 140 to 150 megabytes per scan station. Um, so it's really not a huge data footprint when we talk about pulling gigabytes of information off of the off of this for a smaller project. You know that that flat irons example there was probably. Uh, you know, a couple hundred, maybe maybe 500 megabytes at the most, but I really doubt it um, to get all the data off the controller. So I hope that answered the uh, the question for you. The, yes, very, very interesting. Chris, I really want to thank you again for uh, helping us out with this. Uh, everybody at NEI appreciates it. All of our attendees appreciate it. This is a phenomenal new piece of equipment that I think is going to change the way we survey. And um, there again, I just want to say thank you. And I guess this presentation is over with. Be looking for the next one. It's just right around the corner, I'll bet. All right. Well, yeah, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. really appreciate uh, your time, and it's been, a, it's been an honor, and I hope I get to meet any of you face-to-face. -face. Uh, thanks again to Robert, William, and everybody there at NEI for, uh, for hosting this great event.